Hey, everybody. Welcome to Podcast Informing, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Clint Eastwood, where we watch every film directed by and or starring American filmmaker Clint Eastwood and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one, the show is hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Jake Sterling. I'm one of the guys. My name is Ian Ryan. I'm in a a bit of of a hurry today. on that one. Okay. All right. Well, guess what? I have to announce tremendous news for the podcast, which is, of course, that in the course of preparing for this episode, I learned... That actually you get a lot of points for tries and it's good to be in the try zone and that's enough. <laughs> so actually that's We're fine. renaming the show to the try guys. We're going to call yeah. ourselves the try guys. Yeah. Now. Cool. Yep. And uh, cheating on our wives. Mm-hmm. Just kidding. Is that, that's what the guy did, right? That's what the guy did with a fan. I think we don't have to worry about that too much. Yeah. No, it's not. There's a couple of reasons why that. <laughs> yeah. It seems like you guys didn't even watch their apology video because they did apologize for their crimes against yeah. their wives, I guess. I don't know. Wait, did two of them cheat? Was it two? Did two of the Try Guys cheat with each other? <laughs> that would be, be a cool. cool twist. Ten yeah. tries in and it's like who, we're hey, cheating on that? each other with each who, other. Hold on. Who is that? Yeah, we got to bring what in our guest. Fuck? Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. I our did guest it. today. Shut up. Our guest today is a film fan. He's also a big time sporto. And he's a man who once walked into a screening of The Flash fully one hour late. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. My other friend named Ian, Ian Green. Hello. Hello. How you doing, other Ian? Great to be here. I actually was, I think it was, I think it was maybe an hour and a half late to The Flash. No, that's, is that possible? I I got there when Michael Keaton was on screen and they were like electrocuting uh, Ezra Miller, I guess. So So. here's. You you managed to be so late to the movie that it became impressive again that you came, you know? I always show up. <laughs> yeah. Not on time, but I will show up he eventually. Will. Yeah. And I got the gist of it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you didn't miss anything. We talk about The Flash a fair amount. I was going to say, you it could have gotten the gist of it just from listening to any episode of this podcast <laughs> where we talk about it all the time, <laughs> incessantly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's really seared into my mind. Mm-hmm. First of all, there's two of there's two Ezra Millers in it. Mm-hmm. That's Just like now. Too, it's a choice for sure, undeniably. Mm-hmm. It, they Wait, made a choice. What, hold on, Ian. What, what was this that you were trying to? Are you trying to suggest that uh, non-binary people have some kind of a schism within their psyche? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Certainly not. Is that what you at said? Is that what you just said? You said Ezra Miller's behavior is is to your mind typical of. Uh, people with uh, on the uh, other points uh, on the gender spectrum between the poles. Is that what you were That's saying? That's what I heard. That is, I heard that as well. Just to, mm-hmm. to reiterate. Okay, interesting. I was I was coming in with a, a strong desire to form an Ian alliance, and now I've uh, I regret that it's canceled. Can't spell alliance without Ian. No. Yep. I- that's Just a good to point. Check, and also, I sure am down true. to switch sides as it's, uh, you know, as it benefits <laughs> me personally. Mm-hmm. So, just like, you know. Me too. Is that like a, you mean sexually, right? Oh, yeah. yeah that Yeah. I mean, that's how uh-huh. this pod's going to end. Shout right? out to my girlfriend's dad who might be listening. Um, <laughs> What uh, what are we going to call each other? I mean, I'm fine, but we need a system of nomenclature. Hmm. I'm hmm. thinking Ian... <sighs> Well, that's, I mean, that's going to be part of it for sure. I'm not done with that, but. Okay. You're thinking Ian, Ian, though? That's what you're that's thinking. That's a good Ian. start. That's a good start. I like where you're coming from. Yeah. How Seems about promising Ian for one or both Prime of us. Mm-hmm. and Ian Green? <laughs> Prime and Grind. <laughs> well, no, because no, Ian Ryan. Uh huh. We can't have Ryan and Prime. I think it should rhyme. Yeah. I think that would it be fun if it rhymes because it would like, make it basically as confusing. But that's just, I don't know. That's my idea. Okay. I'm going to call you Ian Green. That's, yeah, green, yeah. I've, I've been man. a first last name guy. Like, I have had friends in my life who've referred to me by the by the full name. It's like one of those. Not everyone, but. Well, it, it does. It does kind of. Uh, they almost rhyme in a sort of Sean Bean way that is tantalizing to the tongue. Mm-hmm, you know? That's true. Yeah. Ian Green. That's what I usually call you. Yeah. Mm-hmm, it's true. Yeah, you're like you IFC. Always on slightly off. Yeah, and of course you can call me anything. Just don't call me late for dinner. I have a real hard out for this episode of the podcast <laughs> <laughs> for, for dinner. So okay, great. Well, so the folks might have guessed it because this episode is, of course, on the film Invictus, and so mm. we are holding our own Ian Victus here yep. on the show. 
credit where credit is due to Ian Green, who Thank came you. up with Invictus. Basically, the reason why I'm on this episode now, because we were texting a little bit, like sort of about other episodes, but this one isn't, I'm guessing people were knocking the doors down to be on this episode, that not a lot of people ride for this one. We have not had a huge amount of demand for this episode. No. I did reach out to John Gabris, the Jonah Lomu of podcasting. Of course. Mm-hmm. The homie. And he hit my cries went unanswered. But uh, Gabris, you're welcome on the show anytime. Sorry the, about the time um, uh, when I sort of doxed you by saying that you, I saw you at an AMC theater. <laughs> I know which one you're talking about, reason. so we could dox him further if uh, yeah, you were we there. Want. I think weren't you there? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't see it. You did. You came to me and you said I just was near John Gabrus's penis. I believe that was your exact right. We, we were in the that bathroom. Like, but yeah, I guess yeah, if you're near, clear, yeah. Yeah, if you're near anyone, yeah, at any point. Well, but I think he probably had it out because if we were in the room where you're allowed to do that, because I think he probably That's took true. it out of his pants. He did and, it responsibly, and you reported yeah. perhaps irresponsibly to me that you had been near it. But yeah, yeah. What movie did we see? We saw all the beauty in the bloodshed, which is a oh, wonderful yeah. movie. Good I should have played to that one as well. Shout um, out Nan Golden was the, recently. Uh, she was recently at the Statue of Liberty protesting. Uh, oh. the uh, genocide in gaza uh shout out Nick. terrific all-around awesome lady yeah she's she rules Ian, you were gonna say something uh no okay Pretty all right end of the episode or? for this yep. show <laughs> okay cool. um well so besides besides being uh my other friend ian and the the sort of undeniable frisson that comes from mm-hmm. that um ian green you've also uh had an experience that gives you something of uh, a level of expertise at least relative to us uh, for the subject matter of this film would you like to elaborate yes He's so i actually um big, big time <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah i was there and i was i was uh i was about it of course um your cat is looking at a beer cap i'm recording this in jake's apartment by the way i don't know if we we're gonna yeah. wait to reveal that but um, He's in the other i'm surrounded room by felines but um okay so my my expertise is that I have actually been to two uh, All Blacks games, the the New wow. Zealand national rugby team. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but I, I studied abroad in Wellington about New Zealand about ten years ago, so what we went to a was game her, there. What was Come the, on, her, man! The I was I made a decision not to. You okay. got to join me. In that. Did you ever go to Auckland? Uh, yeah, we flew into Auckland and we were there for like a day or two. So you can say you were like the cramps, like the famous live record by the cramps you were rocking and reeling in Auckland, New Zealand. Mm-hmm. One could say that. And you did just did. So, yeah. You yeah. saw a rugby game and you, what did you call the team? You called the guys <laughs> the team something? Oh, fuck. Uh, they are called the All Blacks. That is their yeah. official name. They were black. So I guess that's part of it. Hopefully they wear all their of it. uniforms. I'm, I think it refers to their uniforms because most yes. uniforms have more than one color, I guess. Yeah, and they, it really is. It's black. I mean, there's some white in there as well. But yeah, it's basically just Uh-oh. a black uniform. And they're famous for their for their haka celebration or, or yeah. kind of intimidation thing, which is uh, at least briefly depicted in the movie. And uh, seeing that live is cool. It, yeah, it rules. Seeing the haka yeah. rules. It's, it's extremely big- cool. South yep. Pacific population in my town growing up, and they would do it sometimes like at assemblies. It rocks. Oh, wow. Is that would, true? I didn't know that. Would yep. they have had ties to New Zealand specifically or just like in the general kind of Pacific You know Islander? what? I think it was mostly uh, people from uh, Tonga and American Samoa. And okay. I don't know how that works exactly. Not going to speculate on what the crossover is I there. think probably some uh, shared cultural Contact. I believe so as well. Yep. Um, I, now, interestingly, m- much of the the place where you're from, Ian, much of the connection to New Zealand is uh, the purchase of large tracts of land to go and hide in uh, yep. when the shit hits the fan. That's, that's right. That's, that's a popular move. The tech guys like to go over there. Speaking of tech guys, boy, do we have some South Africa to talk about. On today's episode, <laughs> so sure uh, but yeah. but wait, in Green, what, what? Who did the All Blacks play? Do you remember? Okay, I was trying to remember this. I'm I'm pretty sure they played. I think they played another. I think they played an Australian team, another rugby team. Um, <laughs> yes, but 
like part of trying to remember if it actually was the South African national team that they were playing. I don't think it I mean, was, but still, I was trying to replay. Yeah. They are a force in in rugby, South Africa. Like South Africa well, and New Zealand are like the the, the big you know Yeah, South Africa two. I believe is has the four World Cup championships. Yeah, I think it's they have four. I think New Zealand also has four, maybe maybe they actually haven't even had the Rugby World Cup for that long. It had only yeah. Well, yeah. been like one or two before the 95 one. And yeah, and I guess England had has won a Rugby World Cup as well. Um, but I think those are the three teams that have won. There's, uh, I was looking into sort of the, the history of rugby. Interesting, interesting stuff. Generally kind of a former fancy lad public school, like English version of public school, very rich public school guys forcing their silly little calvin ball game that they made up on uh everyone else when i figured out that lifting up a guy was part of the sport and not just like a fun thing they were doing with the kids i was really i had to monumenting or a like monuments yeah what Um, now what is this gotta say that's a good name i mean that is a descriptive (laughs) term for when they do that and i do like a sport that involves lifting up a guy like that's fun like you know like literally doing that it's usually more metaphorical but Mm. yeah it is fun it's like just lifting up a giant lad. It's a yeah. big lad sport. It often is. Know? It's a it's a sport for big lads. Although I want to put on record that the only person that I was close to as a child who played rugby was my friend Sophia. Big shout out to Sophia T. Shout out to Sophia. Just a, a rugby phenom. T? Is that what you said? Yep. Is this a, an initial or is it she related to our, our guest of last That's week? That's an initial. That's an initial okay. for her privacy. Haven't spoke to her in a decade. The T is for Teal, Sophia Teal. <laughs> well, I will. Peter. Okay, now we have to edit this part out. But also, I just wanted to not get into her last name is, <laughs> which is a real tough thing. <laughs> for her. Oh, that, so, just, we should bleep that. Just why bleep would she want to? Yeah. We don't have a bleep. Yeah, we don't have a bleep. Have that. Had Boo. to have a strong spirit to yeah, survive. Such a yeah. real backbone. And paired it with um, a strong body. It's like I went to elementary school with a kid named Nobbly Penis. Um, that's not true. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> and joining us on the podcast today, uh, well, <laughs> with us everywhere we go, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so we're talking Invictus today, but first we gotta we gotta uh, go into our 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 famous segment, the two questions. Mm-hmm. This is uh, one of the segments we do on the show. Um, some say the only one. Ian, were you able to come up with a question for us today? Yes, actually, I have a series of questions. Just while that was writing throughout the movie, but I have one non-Invictus related question. Motherfucker's dyslexic. <laughs> Go ahead. I've I've listened to your episodes and said that it's one or two. It's purposely vague, it seems. So I have one non-Invictus related question, which is: That's right. Yeah, good. Would Clint Eastwood be more or less successful if his name was Cliff Eastwood? Ooh. This is actually, I mean, genuinely, yeah. I think a good question. Stumper. Into sort of, what, it, what would you call this, like nominative determinism or something? Mm-hmm. This is like, sure. that's right. I remember this was a favorite, a favorite topic of the Uncle John's bathroom reader, which was a, uh, it's a big source of my sort of general knowledge. I would read these, not just in the bathroom, but anyway. But you are a bathroom out. reader, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, the, yeah, I read the bathroom for filth. Yeah. Except, mm-hmm. nice. um, and then I, uh, clean it i uh so that but they would they love to to list people who both uh had a last name that was a job who then had that job for example like uh this man named alan Berger uh has a a small local chain of hamburger shops in uh the colorado springs area or whatever and mm-hmm. then they would also have people who had a last name that was a job who would refuse to partake in this like a guy named fletcher who uh, never shot a bow and arrow in his life. Uh-huh. And this is uh, also where I learned that uh, Cooper is somebody who makes barrels. So just a little thing that does not answer your question at all. My answer <laughs> yeah, is... I gotta say, it seems like you're kind of buying time right now, honestly. Yeah. My yep. answer is no. I don't think he would be as successful. I think Less Cliff successful. Richard was very famous when Clint Eastwood was starting to get famous. Clint Eastwood really has cornered the market on Clint's. Like, yep, that's, I think when yeah, you say that's Clint, pretty powerful. The main Clint and the main Eastwood, he's dominated the territory. Yeah, like yeah, they're, like he's sort of the Jonah Lomu of uh, mm. Hollywood. I was just thinking that. Um, I yeah, I feel like yeah, Clint. I can't think of literally anyone else I've ever heard 
named Clint's. But there have been other Cliffs. There's like Cliff Robertson also was contemporaneous. Cliff right? Robertson, the, yes. Yeah. Uncle Ben from Uncle Ben. Um, from Whatever Spider-Man. happened, to Uncle Ben? He uh, he makes rice now. Oh, that's good. Um, is that okay? Uh, to Montgomery say? <laughs> Cliff. It's kind oh, of Montgomery weird. Clift. Yeah, okay, that's, 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 that's yeah. sort of halfway between. Yeah, Clint Clinton and Clint. Cliff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean Clint's name is Clinton, which is interesting mm-hmm. because so they're the name is Clinton. Clint Clintons. <laughs> they murdered that guy. What's that guy's yeah. name? I can't. Yeah, who, who could ever remember the, the the first guy that people think that the Clinton crime family murdered? What's his name? I don't know. Are you, you're not talking about the Lily Express, Mister Man himself? No, 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 no. About? I mean him, obviously. Jeffrey Humphrey. Epstein, Humphrey. Is that his name? <laughs> Humbert yeah. Humbert. 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 Yeah. yeah, Humphrey Humphrey. <laughs> Humphrey. Just that would be better. Stuff. Yeah. No, I'm talking about who is that guy who was like their business partner or something? Hold on, fucking Clinton. Mm. Cl- crime there is a clinton Whoa, crime clinton crime family oh no Selling. no 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 <laughs> clinton body count conspiracy theory this is a terrific yeah. wikipedia page check out our absolute power episode for do more check on it this out topic. i am thinking of vince foster the suicide mm. of vince foster deputy white house counsel who was found dead in fort marcy park in virginia on july the 20th 1993 that's what i'm thinking of does his name ring a bell i didn't know about this one that's the first now. Yeah. That's- yeah. So I think we both agree that Clint is crucial to his mm-hmm. success. Mystique. Yeah. He was really good as Mystique. <laughs> yeah, I mean, be. Mystique could look like Clint Eastwood. Like in Disappeared the into the role. It's- it's- oh, yeah. yeah. That's good. good. That's really good. Yeah. All right. That's going to be the end of the show. <laughs> um, I have a question. If, if it please the court. Yeah, sure, man. Mm, okay. Approach the bench. Nice. Did you guys hear those? That was good. No, that was good footsteps. Foley work. I'm wearing Crocs, <laughs> so it doesn't really sound good. Yeah, I can confirm he's wearing Crocs. I'm not wearing any shoes right now. Oh, yeah, me neither. Pretty cool. Pretty. Can you guys? I don't I, I don't believe you. Come on. Put him up on the. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of those guys who tweets like. Uh, yeah, I'm showing for you oh, right wow. now. Immediate. Oh, these are dirty. Sorry, I got to. Yeah, I got to clean these bad boys. It's like when, when a guy tweets like I've never seen a woman uh, wearing a an undershirt with no brassiere sure. look good. Yeah, <laughs> so that, uh, yep. I've never seen a, a woman with sleeve tattoos uh, threatening me on video look hot. <laughs> so then a bunch of people do it. Your question. My question. So the, imp- the impictus, the impetus for this film. Mm. Uh, I believe uh, originates with uh, a mention by Nelson Mandela, the real man, uh, saying mm-hmm. someone asked him who he would want to play him in a movie, I believe, around the time of this, these real events. And he suggested Morgan Freeman because yep. people had remarked upon their resemblance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think this put a seed in in Morgan Freeman's mind, the famous mind seed. <laughs> Uh, and he <laughs> was looking for an opportunity to play him for, yeah. for years. My question is, who would you want to play you in a movie? Uh, mm. My answer is Ian Green. My answer is famous Fuck. actor Ian Green. I didn't Green. think about this at all. <laughs> oh, nice. That's good. <laughs> and, Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm honored. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, could, I think, yeah, I could do that. It wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be awful. Nobody would be like... No way. People would say, no. like, oh, I guess he he must have had a good audition or something. People might be like, who is this guy, both the subject and the main actor as well? <laughs> who is, who is either what is, is this film? Yeah. 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 Uh, now, I guess maybe my real answer based on what's been told to me before, and I may have already mentioned on the podcast, is uh, famous actor Linguini from Ratatouille, the d- digitally created man of <laughs> People have called you Linguini? Yes. Yep. Wow. Like, look at this linguini motherfucker. Like, I don't know, something like that. Like, yelled at you on the street. Weak chin looking guy. So I always like, just kind of flattened spaghetti looking ass guy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would sort of make sense because you have all those brothers who kind of look like you, and linguini is sometimes difficult to tell from fettuccine or tagliatelle, maybe from Ah, far away. Pappardelle. You know? That's good points. Yeah. What about yourself? You're talking to me? Yeah. I am no, I've been accused of looking me. like a number of people. Accused? In the mm-hmm. past, someone once said Ezra Miller, which Ezra Miller is much more angular and generally kind of prettier than me. At a, there was a time when it made a little more sense. 
Yeah, confusingly, you used to look more like Ezra Miller. I I somewhat agreed with this when I heard it for the first time in college, and yeah. now I don't. It doesn't imagine Ezra sense. Miller with you know tens of pounds of depression weight mm. and uh, shorter and oh. um, fewer but, accusations of yeah. I was going to uh, say doing abuse better for and the false world. imprisonment and stuff, <laughs> but uh, Ezra Miller could stand to have some depression, honestly, just like kind of lay low. It seems like maybe, slowing you know? slowing Ezra Miller down might might mm. uh, solve everyone's problems. Too fast. I've also been told that I look like a young Richard Gere, which is very generous. Just from below the belt, though. But you know what? You know what I'm going to go with is uh, actually the kid who plays Deacon. Ted's younger brother in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure who takes hmm. Napoleon to the ice cream place. Okay. If uh-huh. you look this kid up and look up a picture of me Piggy. in about ninth grade, uh-huh. it's the same boy. So I'm going to say okay. Deacon from Bill and Ted. IG, who are you Who are you going with? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. I've kind of, I took my hat off and I'm you kind did. of staring at myself, trying to figure out I sh- who I, I would cast say myself also, as. I've accused Ian Ryan of looking like Muppet Baby's Bobby Cannavale before. Because you look like a Bobby, you look like a more youthful and sort of uh, narrower Bobby Cannavale. He's like sort of, he's a pretty big, broad guy. And you, Ian, you look like, like a, you look like you you will play Bobby Cannavale in the the Paul Dano section of the <laughs> Love and Mercy. Sure. Uh, about yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, yes, you have said this. I've checked with other people and I've never heard confirmation on this, but I think it's kind of nice because it means you see something in me that's totally unique. We should say this. We haven't really talked about this, though. I am pretty visually impaired, to okay. be clear. It's not true. <laughs> yeah. Ian, who would you cast to play yourself? I don't really have an answer for you, honestly. Yeah, I've honestly been thinking. I've heard like a couple. He looks like random- a white guy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably we should go white. I would say that'd be the first oh, one right off the <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people who are listening to this nodding uh, viscerally in agreement. But um, I don't know. There's a lot of guys who you don't know their name, but they were in like 22 Jump Street and uh, two Netflix shows you don't remember watching, and like a good Funny or Die sketch that you look like. You know what I mean? You look like a bunch of brown haired. Uh, sort of comedy adjacent people. There's a, maybe like Drew a little... Tarver or something. I don't know. Yeah, uh, sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, I was gonna say Bob Costas, but it could be the the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Famous okay. uh, screen actor Bob Costas. Yeah, no, he's yeah, no, he's a good one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've mm-hmm. I've heard Ethan Hawke in the past, but he's way older, and I also don't see it really. You don't look like um, Ethan Hawke at all. No offense. Yeah, I it's don't like, know. That's what someone to told be clear, me. Once. It's very possible to to be a good looking person who doesn't look anything yeah. like Ethan Hawke. I just want to yep, clarify. I don't know. But many you're, many sure. people. You may be one of those people. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Yeah, it's a good question. I uh, I don't know. I've been watching ER recently, and Anthony Edwards. On he's he's great on that show. And yeah, I feel I'll like, give you an I mean, Anthony Edwards. Yeah, you, don't, you have I don't the, know. the the deep voice though that Anthony Edwards doesn't really have. That's true. Yeah, who's a I've heard John Hamm before, which seems that I didn't want no, to say that no because offense, that's like but no. Yeah, no, I I think again. closer to a less bald Mark Moses. Is that his name? Mark Moses. Oh yeah, Mark Moses. Sure. You know what yeah. the thing is with John Hamm is that mm-hmm. around like season five of Mad Men, uh-huh. people started saying John Hamm's prodigious Johnson is yeah causing a lot of problems on the show. It's like the suiting. How could it have not caused problems until season five? Until like it was so obviously it. Mm-hmm. stupid and fake. Yep. And yet, like this, it's not like from 1966 to 1967 or something. Pants got way tighter and and sheerer. Well, they just horse shit. Actually, might have. No, no. Okay. I'm a I'm a uh, late pants 50s suits historian. pretty baggy. Are you saying okay. that Johnson is fake? Are you claiming? No, that? I'm just saying no, that no, the no, prop. No, there was no problem. What yeah. I'm saying is this man, I'm sure he, you know, he he can get compression shorts or Maybe whatever. Maybe he had a I'm late growth the, spurt in that department. Hmm. At like 39? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, that's the two questions. Invictus. This week, uh-huh, on the podcast, yeah. talking 2009, uh, Clint Eastwood, ever heard of him? Yes, Directed. I have. He's uh, a born Cliff Eastwood. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wish I was born off of a cliff, you know? <laughs> Yeah, Wait, yeah. I like to bury you there myself. Yeah. Released December eleventh, two thousand nine. This is a film starring Morgan Freeman and Max Demon as Invictus himself. Uh, I was I gonna call him Max Diamond, 
and my girlfriend said that's too far away and yeah, i said what about right. max demon and <laughs> she, she, she said is okay. right yeah she's yeah. constantly reining you in which is it's, extremely she didn't say okay she probably said work. fine she's like okay yeah it's matt damon matt damon had either of you seen this film before nope no okay ian you had not seen basically any clint eastwood films prior to me giving you a very large stack of blu-rays is that right yeah True stack false? of blu-rays fall, fell off a truck into a trader joe's bag um yeah no i honestly don't have a ton of clint eastwood experience um it's kind of writing down trying to figure out all the ones that i've seen and i watched i watched like million dollar baby this past week as well sort of mm. in conjunction with this one um tried to get a few others in but didn't yeah i mean i've seen like mystic river Gran Torino. I'm a big Sully fan. Love Richard Jewell. Mm. I've seen him play Misty for me. That's that was really good. The Mules, all right. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. That's basically it, honestly. I like I've missed Hillary all the Hillary Swank. It more, you know, when it comes to Vince Foster, that's uh, Hillary's whack. Yeah, I guess Hopefully. you had to wait for this episode to be able to say that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. I think you saw the trifecta, <laughs> the necessary trifecta of this is kind of just Million Dollar Baby meets Gran Torino. Yeah. Meets well, we should talk Africa. about it. So mm-hmm. this film is about the somewhat unbelievable story of the 1995 Rugby World Cup in which the Springboks team, the, the South African national rugby team, who had been excluded from international competition for years by... Uh, anti-apartheid boycott now in this first world cup since uh, nelson mandela had been released from prison and voted into the presidency of south africa Mm -hmm. south africa is now hosting the rugby world cup and this dog shit team comes from nowhere to spoiler alert win the game the whole thing the whole thing is one game as far as i I understand Mm -hmm. um Incorrect. They have a couple other earlier games in there. <laughs> nope. Right. Yeah, no, they do. <laughs> to my recollection, I've now seen the film twice, which is uh, more than I anyone should has ever seen. Get it. some kind of a medal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, including Clint. I think he's only seen it like half of one time. Well, you watch the whole thing. Is it's like me? I don't listen to the episode back after I finish editing it. I put it mm-hmm. up, and then if someone tells me there's a problem, I say. Eh. Anyway, does anyone say a racial slur in this film? I don't think so. No, there's like uh, someone says like this country is going to the dogs or whatever, yes. but mean, they don't really Francois, say like or that it's the coach at the beginning, Mr. Maybe. Pinar yeah, just, or whatever. Yeah, no one says. Was that an like, impression no one, of one of the white people in the movie? Just one yes, 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 yes. I'm like, I would like to try to do the voice. But I'm like, I got to make sure I do the do the white South African yeah. voice. Grimes. Grimes. voice. You yeah. have my wife, but I'm. He doesn't <laughs> yeah. sound nearly. Elon Musk doesn't sound nearly south african enough he's because he spent a lot of his time in in canada mm-hmm. all of the blood money of course is south african to be clear but mm-hmm. yes well i feel like that's a general like rich guy thing or just like you just you're not gonna like you lose that accent if you're like just in whatever space is that like propel you to that point it's like you're not gonna be like the person that actually sounds like that they're from there and their generations from there or whatever so go ahead and do your carlos slim impression real quick <laughs> <laughs> God is it? Uh, you're right. So, well, weirdly, I w- I'm going to just say straight up top: the film both has too much and not enough racism simultaneously. It seems like <laughs> it just can't get it right. We need so, more. Yes, yeah. it we doesn't need have. More. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't they're have any the, they're racial slurs. The dials. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not listening. They're not looking back at the audience enough. I mean, as we were talking about, we were talking about this on our on our Gran Torino episode, which one Ian is familiar with the contents of and the other is not Mm -hmm. that film is very careful to avoid anti-black racism like anti-black racial slurs with the exception of one antiquated one but like yes it's it's this kind of and this is of course clint's first film no his second film to come out (laughs) during Mm -hmm. obama's presidency but his first Mm -hmm. to like sort of be made entirely within the presidency because Gran Torino came yeah. out in like lame duck bush period but and I think I think uh, Invictus filmed like in the summer of 2009 or so like was that what it was yeah like, yeah the, it's yeah. a classic Clint quick turnaround yeah but this is this really feels like a post-racial film and especially showing Mandela 
like President Mandela as a Obama era friendly figure of reconciliation, figure of forgiveness, and specifically forgiveness as a means to neoliberal continuity. Right, which of course is basically the legacy of post-apartheid South Africa. Right? We're going to do a big old critique of Mandela from the left. Everybody get I ready. Love it. Yep. Oh boy. Ian was saying, Ian, Ian Ryan was saying to me, I'm so excited for the, the Invictus episode. We can finally take this guy down a peg. <laughs> this Nelson <laughs> Mandela. I'm so excited uh -huh. to yeah. speak yeah. ill of yep. him. No, 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 no. But for real, for real, it's uh, South Africa still really racist. I mean, it's like... Yeah. It's racist and unfortunately, economically disastrous. So even the attempt at neoliberal like kowtowing was unsuccessful i mean it's funny because like they go to south Africa, they film this movie in south africa and like mm -hmm. the sort of shack towns are still there to be filmed in and it's not like <laughs> they're suddenly 50 percent yes. white you know yes yep mm -hmm. interesting uh and i hadn't really thought about this because of course nelson mandela is you know he was a a saintly man according to all of the sort of remembrances of him in 2013 when he died. And yet, when you look at it, um, there's still some problems there. So, you know, mm -hmm. well, what's I the mean, deal? Huh? What's the yeah, what's the deal? Like, I mean, well, one, I feel like the his story just so perfectly fits into kind of the neoliberal like thing that we're bringing up where it's like it's just like a man who like was in jail. Then he like came out and then he like let it he like put that aside yeah a lot of yep. country united you know what I, like it just it's such a clean yeah. narrative that it, it does make sense that one it would be a you know a 60 million dollar movie at some point starring morgan freeman and that he did just kind of become this larger than life iconic figure that seems almost like there's there's no way to critique him almost it seems at least in like a national media landscape well so i i have here don't just take it from me some fucking guy and even worse a podcast uh, the worst guy. type of guy, honestly, to a be. podcast. I can't Pretty speak. Much. I'm trying to look at, look something up while I'm talking. Y'all ever seen another movie about South African apartheid? I realized about three seconds into this film, I said, yeah. "Wow, why is this the only movie that I've ever seen?" Well, about so this, this is topic? a yeah. There's there have since since this film there have been so many Mandela movies. There have there were Mandela movies before. There was one called Mandela and De Klerk, uh starring Sidney Poitier. And Michael Caine as the clerk. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yep. <laughs> exactly. It was a television <laughs> film from 1997. <laughs> really uh, that was good. I like that. And then we have um, who else Long is in Walk it? to Freedom. Yes, yeah, the, you've got. Also, there was a mini series starring Lawrence Fishburne as Mandela. Got to say, none of these have, of course, Morgan Freeman, who you know looks fairly like him. Obviously, he Morgan does. Freeman. Very distinct has from, for his little freckles, which mm -hmm. Mandela doesn't really have. I guess Morgan Freeman looks the most like Mandela of all of them, but I'm just, I sort of also like again, it's just like an icon playing another icon, which I'm curious if that has ever really worked. And I'm, I was trying to think of other examples of like an iconic presence playing an iconic person and actually working instead of like it kind of yeah. overwhelming the movie, which I think it sort of I does mean, here a bit. I guess the the great dictator. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only one I can think of. A guy who's like sort That's of a stole point. a mustache mustache style. And Yeah, who had the mustache first? Was it Chaplin or, or Adolf? I think Chaplin probably had it for longer, yeah. I don't I mean I don't I'm not looking at pictures of of Hitler in the World War One or whatever. Yeah. Because I'm not a freak, but I gotta imagine he tried some stuff out before he settled on the sure. toothbrush. Yeah. Actually my second question was who was the worst guy, uh Charlie or Great off. I mean, both pretty bad. Hitler, just sheer numbers that he's putting up. <laughs> That's true. Um, but Chaplin, Chaplin, not great though. No, but it, yeah, but li just limited impact. Sure, exactly. Yeah, I would agree. To be clear, I would hundred uh, percent agree. Yeah. Good. What's interesting though is, so I mean, people would say Morgan Freeman and Mandela look a lot alike. I actually don't think they really do, though, honestly. Like, that's what I'm like. I feel like I was just like, that's Morgan Freeman. Like, they actually do have pretty, I feel like different, like, eye shapes. Like, they don't. On the, uh, physically... on the, the Blu ray, there's some special feature stuff talking about, like, the, him getting into character and meeting Mandela. He met, he, he was sort of a friend of Mandela. And people were talking to you know, all these interestingly, exclusively blonde women who worked closely with 
Mandela would say, it started to get sort of freaky because I realized, you know, I'm talking to Morgan Freeman, not Madiba. They all and any white person who calls him Madiba, that's an immediate, immediate red flag for me. I don't and see this is where I'm gonna just have to just take a back seat and say, I don't know enough about the associations to say, is that somebody trying to be good or is that nasty or is that I weird? just remember seeing like when he died, I remember hearing like or maybe reading a statement from Nancy Pelosi in which she said. <laughs> now, Nancy Pelosi, generally, I have some other problems with. Like, it's not the first right, thing sure, she did yes. that rubbed me the wrong way. Easy but to disqualify. It gives me. Obviously, if someone who is like Mandela's secretary and uses this term of endearment that was, you know, at least, at least originally came from black South African followers of Nelson Mandela's political struggle, that's one thing. But anyway, they're all saying, I can't believe that it's the actor guy and not the other guy. Mm -hmm. To which I say, right. if from 1995 or so on, Morgan Freeman's great dream was to play Nelson Mandela in a film. You'd think he would have practiced the accent. Sure, yeah. He yeah. is barely doing it. He is that. He kind of does it in the first scene, and then I feel like it almost <laughs> immediately disappears. <laughs> I, I agree uh, with my colleague, and this is actually, I think, mostly the better choice. I think I preferred that to him trying to go really hard on it. I mean, yeah. Matt Damon, mm -hmm. I googled Matt Damon South African accent response or something. Well, famously, to to Trevor out. Noah said it was really good, right? Oh, I don't know about this. Which but, of the yeah. two? Trevor Noah said that said that Matt Damon's accent was very impressive to him. Interesting. I found one Vanity Fair article where the journalist just really phoning it in, like called up their South African friend who was like a lawyer or something, and, and yeah. showed them the trailer to this and the trailer to Blood Diamond, and said, "What okay. do you think? Who did it better?" And pretty unequivocally, he said that Leo did a better job. Interesting. I haven't seen Blood Diamond. I literally asked this of Jake, like, while we were driving around earlier today, being like, is this better or worse than the... Where that's were we, the other dri where, where were we driving right. around? Who forgot their fucking dongle? <laughs> who didn't mention the dongle, one. And then you also didn't mention yeah, they could bring who headphones. Lost, who lost their dongle that they thought they had in their apartment? <laughs> fucking me. Yeah. So, so we're pointing fingers both... Two and f yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah. I'm somehow pointing all five fingers. I'm pointing. I've got my fingers and my thumb all pointing at me. You were just in Italy, so you're doing the. You know, you're doing the five I finger. A, you know, yeah. The five finger discount. You're saying that all Italian people <laughs> steal they shoplift stuff. Probably true. I mean, proof is in the pudding. We're allowed to now, still be racist mean? towards explain, Italians, right? Explain. I think he's saying at the bottom of the tiramisu, there is <laughs> okay. uh, a secret. There's a lady fingers. Paper. Again, uh -huh. can we get. We're allowed to still make fun of Italians. It's like the last one we have. As far as right? I know, yeah. I would say yeah. it's still fair game. Like Are you Italian our children or whatever. I'm not, Andy, I wish Andy. I was, honestly. I wish I had a little Italian in there. I think they're they're wonderful people. I did yesterday. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, I believe it's passed through the old system. Yeah, I had I, I, yeah, I <laughs> ate an Italian sandwich today, actually. So yeah, that's, hey. that's, yeah hmm. here we go. Speaking of my trip to Italy, hmm. I also, on my All way right, back. Steve Coogan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking of... My Voyage to Italy with Martin Scorsese. But you can go ahead and keep thinking about Steve Coogan if you want. Fucking rude. I mean, the man has made multiple trips. That's true. There's no denying this. I, I So I went to, I stopped in, I had a, a layover in Dublin on the way back. Mm -hmm. 24 hours in Dublin, basically just enough time to like walk around Dublin for a couple hours, mostly before any businesses were open. And I had occasion to walk through the grounds of Trinity College, Dublin. And mm. I remembered that when I was in, in school... At UCLA, which is where Ian Ryan and I met, That's right. uh, the English department had a close relationship with the English department of Trinity College, Dublin. And there was a study abroad program that was basically like turnkey. Like you could kind of just yeah. say, I want to go to Dublin and you could go. And a number mm -hmm. of my English department friends is a strong word, but like the people <laughs> I was friendly with in my class, I just didn't, I had a hard time in college. Uh, they went to... Ireland, I thought it would be kind of cool, but it was sort of like, you know, one form too many, and I didn't go. Mm -hmm. And so walking around Trinity College, which is a lovely ancient place and and uh, feels cool to be there, I was thinking, what? how would my life have been different if I, you know, if I'd gone here instead of staying in LA for that, that What did you semester? land on? 
I determined it would be very different. I'd probably be close friends with a guy named like Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine that. And yeah, uh, wow. I probably sliding doors, huh? From from the the weather there, I probably would have developed depression. Yeah, it is rainy. <laughs> and there, yeah. what I based on uh, what I saw a lot of uh, in in Dublin, I probably would have um, eaten too much pizza. So things would have been really different. <laughs> that famous so, Irish pizza. <laughs> little half cocked comedy bit I came up with here, but no, but for real on the airplane back, there was a, a documentary called like when sports changed the world or something like that. It's like, it's, I think it was the moments I, I tried to watch this, but I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, the moment preview, sports but, changed the yeah. world, something, yeah. something to this effect. Let's see if I can find it here. No, but anyway, <laughs> it was produced by Red Bull studios for yeah, freebie, free. Amazon freebie. And it was about this very event. And the the sort of the history of rugby in South Africa and its connection to apartheid uh, explained that, for example, South African rugby was one of the places that the international community focused on to put pressure on the apartheid regime to make changes, most notably by boycotting South African uh, national team rugby games, specifically in New Zealand. A lot of cool uh, activism against those games, uh, people pushing down fences. They had to play those games behind barbed wire. Yeah, this is. It's, I will say this entire prep for this episode, in the context of the current Palestinian genocide, has just been very eye-opening to consider how quickly people immediately started rejecting South African apartheid. Basically, I mean, South African apartheid had its roots, you know, in the colonial takeover of South Africa hundreds yeah. of years earlier. But as soon as it became official in 1948, almost immediately people were saying, do not do this. Do not take people's land and forcibly resettle them. Yeah. Do not create two systems where one people can vote. And I wonder if there's anything different about like if it had happened in 1948. Sure, you know, safe. is that I mean, why people treated South Africa differently? I'm doing a little joke. Uh-huh. And now, of course, is the time for jokes. Everyone's saying this, but it's crazy. I mean, it's just nuts. <laughs> it that- is crazy. I mean, the the Olympic Committee by nineteen the whatever the nineteen sixty four Tokyo Olympics was already saying you cannot be here because what you're doing is horrible. And just yeah. a few years later, Israel is just taking huge amounts of land in nineteen sixty seven. Bizarre. Yep. But we'll get more on that in a, in a second. Okay. So this documentary goes through this, shows, you know, scenes of especially like white New Zealanders. And it's not like New Zealand. New Zealand is also a colonial outpost. And mm-hmm. like South Africa, they also got rugby, this fucking British boys game. And, you know, white New Zealanders are like, apartheid sucks. We hate this. We don't want them to come play here in the 70s or whatever. And then. Fast forward to Mandela is released from prison in 1990 after 27 years. Mm-hmm. He was a an African nationalist and a socialist. He originally took nonviolent tactics um, when those stopped working or didn't work rather, and he was brought up on various bogus charges. He turned to more violent means. Mm-hmm. As did generally the ANC and the Communist yes. Party in about 1960 after the Sharpville Massacre. Look up this horrible thing if you don't know about it. Nelson Mandela is put in prison on Robben Island, which is a little island off the coast of Cape Town, and he lived there for 27 years and is sort of the focal point of international anti-apartheid protests. Let Mandela out, free Mandela, things like this. It's at least an appropriate name for the island. It's a jail. Hmm. Robin. Robin, like uh, like the crime. I don't think it's appropriate at all. I don't think it's appropriate. You don't think it's appropriate? That. I don't like is that. It, should I leave? I well, should it's leave, R-O-B-B-E-N. Though. Uh-huh. So... You would never. He should have known this. And also, yeah, sh- what Jake said was wrong because I believe he was on three different <laughs> island prisons. So everything about this is bad, and we'll just continue. Let's move on. So then Mandela is released basically because of public pressure. Like it's increasingly just a problem for South Africa, especially as it tries to interact with the global economy. Yeah. I mean, there's a successful, massive campaign of universities, businesses, federal governments, all which divest and sanction, which there's some arguments do against this. Us, but do they boycott they, as well? Some of them were also being as well. They beat and they deed and they asked. Speaking of UCLA, this is the reason why the UCs all only serve Pepsi products in their fountains. 
to this mm-hmm. day it's because coca-cola yep. refused to divest from south africa and nelson mandela once shouted out the uc boycott specifically as being a big chunk of money that helped mm-hmm. push things so mandela gets out there is and a lot of this was left out of this movie and also the there's a 30 for 30 documentary about this from mm-hmm. the first season the very first 30 mm-hmm. uh the 16th man it's called that that forget that elides this as well but initially there was a vote among whites only, when it was still when when voting was still restricted to white South Africans, there was a referendum on apartheid that was just white South Africans. That aha, uh-huh. yes, apartheid lost. Yep. And then the franchise is opened up to black South Africans as well. Black South Africans who comprise some like eighty percent of the population. I mean, this is just truly like. Yep, it's shocking to minority to read about. tyranny rule. When we mm-hmm. were watching the. Especially the documentary, the 30 for 30, my girlfriend was like, I, this is unbelievable that like people are saying all of this stuff out loud. <laughs> well, like mm-hmm. in that 30 for 30 too, like one of the main talking heads is just like a fully racist guy just still being very racist. Yeah. Like even though it was that documentary came out <laughs> in 2010. Bosa, I think is who you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the craziest names yeah mm-hmm. yeah it is it is like it's like it's amazing how like brazen it is i guess because you know in other societies where obviously there are racist structures in place like there's more of a yeah politeness over or like whatever trying to mask yeah, it. yeah yeah totally but like yep. south yeah. africa seems like so it like again just for my limited you know knowledge of it it just it is well remarkable and this is a this is a uh, amanda my girlfriend made this observation so i want to credit her but it is so insane that you know like this this racist guy who's on the on the documentary they're talking about how they were worried that once mandela got out that there would be a race war Uh and as a motherfucker you're already shooting it you're what you're worried about is that the other side will shoot back at you but it's yes. not like violence yeah. is going to erupt. Viol- the violence is going to shift toward you. That's what you're worried about. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. Because there's also the element of, uh, I think it's like, you know, it hasn't totally been convincingly proven in the public sphere. But for, you know, if you know, you know that uh, de Klerk was probably like encouraging uh, Zulu and Zosa in fighting or like fighting between tribes. So basically just like encouraging a race war of the non-white people that would benefit the white people. Totally surprising to me that anyone (laughs) would do something like that. Can't think of that. But Mandela gets out and by 1994, the franchise is extended to black people and he is elected president of South Africa. By the way, in 1993, we we mentioned this, I believe, on our Unforgiven episode. 1993 sees the release of the only film directed by Morgan Freeman, which is about a black South African police officer during the apartheid era, played by Danny Glover. Now, what's it? What's it called? Bofa. Mm-hmm. B o p h a! Exclamation point. Yep. Didn't get a chance to watch Bofa. Um, Malcolm McDowell's in it too. Alfred Woodard. Hmm. Uh, music by James Horner. I don't know. Could be good. It uh, made oh, it made two hundred and twelve thousand dollars at the box office. <laughs> mm. Could be good. Eighty-two <laughs> percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. Hey. it's fresh. Mandela is elected and immediately goes into this reconciliatory posture, and his yes. project is to the way he sees forward is to basically put past aside, let bygones be bygones, and try to move forward in a uh with a coalition he goes at the rainbow nation a coalition of black and white south africans in order to prevent i guess violence or strife but ultimately what this does is upholds the neoliberal order and basically doesn't have any structural make any structural change that would allow for more equality of uh, economic opportunity or socioeconomic resources or whatever for black people so the white people still live in their big houses by the cape and they pass them down to their children uh and the same cannot be said for the black population of south africa and now i want to be cautious because in doing comparative global political discussions you're obviously immediately blurring distinctions between times and places and what's happening there and you know what's unique to that situation but i think i am sympathetic to his concerns the concerns he voiced at the time from what I understand, again, I don't know how genuine this is, but he himself was supposedly a socialist, but said that he wanted people to basically like get 
better education about those issues before he was pushing for them was one element, which certainly even in, you know, like the, the, the last years of the protests where uh, the ANC did a great job of encouraging people to make the townships ungovernable. Um, one of the consequences what is that there was other people who took control and made people's courts not unlike uh, certain parts of the Cultural Revolution in China, where where people basically co-opt the revolution, don't have any education about what it really means, and use it to express like violent resentment towards people. So I understand why he was afraid of this. And then he was also afraid of the international response to this. So basically being isolated economically if he pushed for yes. something that wasn't neoliberalism. And we get some, I'll say this about the film, which I generally regard as a full on stinker, but there are a couple of <laughs> scenes in the movie that get at this in ways that I think are, I don't know if they're braver than another director might have tried, but they are at least not really hiding too much of, yeah, of this I, uh, sort of thing. I was considering whether this is this is some mayoral experience coming into play where we're seeing like some actual <laughs> inner working considerations of how do well, you transition bureaucracy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we have the scene where Mandela's sort of, I don't know if she's his secretary, like the, the, this woman who is like the, the sort of policy number two within the film, whose name is Brenda. She is played by Ajoa Ando, who is a British actress. Mm -hmm. Yes. You've Mother is seen English her, and her, her father is from Ghana. Yeah. But she uh, apparently she's on Bridgerton. Um, couldn't possibly give a shit. Oh, the sex show. The show where they yeah, have the, sex. The sex show. The first show mm. to have sex on it. Mm. She's asking where he wants to go first for international investment. And he says that where the most money is the US, the UK, and Saudi Arabia. Which like, those, that's a list of some of the worst guys. Uh, some of the... <laughs> The, the main targets of, for example, uh, resistance from a left, like an international left on, on all kinds of abuses of power and – Particularly in the, in the form of like, you know, structural adjustment agreements and forcing countries yeah. to get into arrangements that are theoretically going to help them grow but actually exploit the local population. And also horrifically. force your goofy collared shirt ball game on uh, people around oh. the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Shots fired. Where? I got. To, I, I did a little. I did some really good physical mm -hmm. comedy. They both laughed, good. but there something happened to their mics, so it didn't get picked yep. up. Yeah. And you also get the scene where, with the the national sports executive, where all of the black people are voting to remove the Springbok emblem and name from the the team. We should say that the the uh, the documentary does a good job explaining that Springbok rugby symbolized apartheid in the minds of many black South Africans because the sport was for a very long time exclusive to white players. We finally have the first black Springbok player in Chester Williams who's on this team. But, you know, rugby is like the sport of the Afrikaners, the whites. The Springbok itself, I mean, the whole thing, you know, it obviously it is a emblem of colonialism and so we have this scene where a fairly large group of black people is is voting to remove the name and call every team affiliated with south africa the proteas which is the name of a very distinctive and and honestly i mean if there was if you had to pick an, an intimidating looking flower it would be this mm. one like a flower <laughs> that would stand up there with like whatever the panthers and the bears and the eagles uh-huh <laughs> that's right. Have you guys seen yeah. this? I have. This flower? It's, a, it's a very pretty flower. I have not. It's no. rugged. Yeah, it's like pointy. It's sort of, it's got, it looks sort of like a, a the most beautiful artichoke you've ever seen. Yep. Mm. That's a good uh, I'm going to send this to, like a thistle. to IG here real quick. Now, uh, I want to reveal something a little bit embarrassing, which is that oh, it's his penis. I was not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was oh, not, looks good, opposed I from. I <laughs> <laughs> from just the theory of the film, the idea of this movie, I am interested and I have become more and more sympathetic almost as an insult to people, but I don't necessarily mean this that this way, to the idea that sports actually might be the kind of territory that would be important to a lot of dumb white guys where you could kind of seed territory or like uh, come up with some type of beautiful rainbow nation coalition. Well, this is what Mandela seems to decide because he shows up at this meeting where there's already been yes. a unanimous vote and basically says you guys you don't you haven't thought this through 
we need to if we take this from the whites they will this will be the last straw and they'll this precarious peace that we've achieved is is going to fall apart which you know i i think it's obviously everybody's got a job or whatever not not everybody can spend as much time thinking and reading about all this stuff as the president but like what we literally have is a guy showing up and making a sort of an autocratic declaration yes. He he puts it to another vote, but he's throwing his he's throwing his Mandela his Madiba mm-hmm. magic behind it his as Mandela the Mandela effect. Uh, do you think people in South Africa like imagine telling a black South African about the Mandela effect? They would <laughs> they would be right to strike you. <laughs> like <laughs> it's true. Yes, I mean it's the same yep. thing as like I always you know when people get, go on about the fucking this the, the we live in a simulation thing. I I suggest that they. Yeah. Ask like, uh, for example, a child that has been burned with white phosphorus if they feel that they're living this in a This is one of the major concerns for them. Yes, yeah, right. you're, exactly. you're correct to propose this. Thank yeah. you. I guess I I'm on. I also say spot. actually don't talk, I, like don't bother the kid. Sure, by the way, sure. Leave yeah, that yeah, yeah. child in, alone. Yeah. This is a purely theoretical exercise. I yeah. I'm okay with this if you're pairing it with say aggressive land reform or something right. or like the the nationalization of electricity yeah i would like to read from an actual south african person real quick okay please there's a guy named patrick bond professor of sociology at the university of johannesburg in south africa joe berg okay. as they call it mm-hmm. this guy oh, now it's really brave what no, nothing. Can read the thing. I was going to say it's really brave of this guy to keep his position as a professor of sociology as he slowly turns into a sort of a shrimp style alien. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Had to come up. Same year. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yep. District 9, same year as this. Uh-huh, and Neil yeah. Blomkamp, who directed that, he took us all from Gamer to Racer on last week's episode. That's true. He Grand just Torino. took us all from Gamer to Racer. Yeah. Okay. So this is from a, a piece he wrote called The Mandela Years in Power for Counterpunch in 2013. Mm. It's a, a quotation. This policy insulation from mass opinion could only be achieved through the leadership of Mandela. It was justified by invoking the mantra of, quote, international competitiveness, end quote, And it initially peaked with Mandela's 1996 growth, employment, and redistribution policy. Obeisance to multinational corporations helped shape the terrain on the platinum belt that inexorably generated the Marikana massacre in 2012, for example. In the South African case, it must be stressed the decision to reduce the room for maneuver was made as much by the local principles as it was by the Bretton Woods institutions, other financiers, and investors. South Africa's democratization was profoundly compromised by an intra-elite economic deal that, for most people, worsened poverty, unemployment, inequality, and ecological degradation, while also exacerbating many racial, gender, and geographical differences. Ending the apartheid regime was one of the greatest human achievements of the past century, However, to promote a peaceful transition, the agreement negotiated between the racist regime and Mandela's African National Congress, or ANC, allowed whites to keep the best land, the mines, manufacturing plants, and financial institutions, and to export vast quantities of cap. So, Patrick Bond has said it, and so we're uh, – it's okay that we said it. We're just here to report it. Yep. Yeah, just the facts. All of this is to say that the movie is about this 1995 Rugby World Cup – the relationship between Nelson Mandela as played by Morgan Freeman and the captain of that that team, Francois Pinar, played by Matt Damon, who is like six inches shorter than the real guy. Mm. He has a funny bit on the Blu-ray where he says when he met Pinar, Pinar opens the door and the first thing Matt Damon says, he according to Matt, Matt Damon, uh-huh. the first thing Matt Damon says is, don't worry, I read a lot bigger on camera. <laughs> Which okay, is funny. Okay, it's fun. Yeah, that's fun. And then he mm-hmm. said, fortune favors the bold. Um, yeah, mm. remember when he's in the crypto <laughs> Normal. commercial. Uh huh. Oh yeah. And so it's about Nelson Mandela <laughs> in many scenes, kind of shirking his responsibilities as uh, president to focus on making sure that the almost all white Springbok team wins the World Cup and that the black population sees them as 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 representatives of all of South Africa instead of just as white South Africa. And he does this by, for example, wearing a Springboks jersey and hat. And the documentary does a good – the documentaries, I should say, they all do a good job of explaining how crazy this was. And it is crazy to see – you see the real president of the country, Nelson Mandela, wearing the hat. Mm-hmm. And there's something just inherently less dramatic about seeing a guy playing the guy wearing the hat. Yeah. 
Like if yep. mm-hmm. if yeah. you showed me a picture of Nelson Mandela putting on a T-shirt that said FBI female body inspector, I'd be like, damn, that's so funny. If you showed sure. me Morgan Freeman as Mandela putting on the same T-shirt, I'd be like, well, he's just goofing around. He's an actor. Like, I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. For sure. And also, I think the real Mandela, he, I mean, say what you will about the like political implications or the empty nature of that act or, or, or whatever, but he looked good. The, the, sh- the long sleeve shirt, the, yeah. the hat, it, yeah. it, was a, it was a good look, honestly, just like at a pure aesthetic level. Looked great. The film does show that he was something of a female body inspector. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, yeah, which I thought was interesting just as a Eastwood aside, because I think this is a real yeah. uh, critique of, of Mandela, kind of like an MLK, Dr. Dr. King style. Yes, we, we've seen, of course, now many uh, non-South African actors have done a at least better job of approximating a South African accent in the Black Panther films, the, the, the mm. accent chosen for Wakanda. The language is based on Zosa and the accent is based on a Black South African accent. So we've now heard, we've seen a bunch of different people get decently good at this. My question to you is, do we think in the one scene when Mandela is dancing with the lady and turns on the, the Riz and says, uh-huh. my father... Was Zosa? He was a polygamist, and when I dance with you, I feel envious of my father. Which is, yes, I mean, that's what he says. That's correct. That's an impressive line. But do mm-hmm. we think uh, that that Morgan Freeman had a click double? Do you think? Do we think he learned uh, the the famously difficult like glottal click when he says Zosa? Or do you think they they doubled this? What do we think? Let's speak ill of the man. Mm, okay. <laughs> Great. Oh, no. No clue. I will say that it doesn't seem like Eastwood style to allow somebody to do like ADR or doubling. So I'm going to guess that they, he just pushed him to get it right. I was thinking that they sing live for Jersey Boys, I read. So like yeah. they sung all the songs yeah. live. So it seems like they would maybe do the the, the noise, the, well, the sound. You, were showing, you, you showed me that clip of Max Demon on Hot Ones. Remember this? <laughs> did, you, did you send this to me? Ian Ryan, hmm. or is it somebody else? Oh, you're talking to me. I have no idea what you're talking about, so no, this is not me. I've, I've seen, I have not seen that to you, but I have seen that episode of Hot Ones. So which, yeah, which part a, are you referring to? There's a clip where he's, there's a, a part where he's talking about how he practiced the, the accent for six months, and Oof. then they do the first shot, mm-hmm. uh, his first shot in the movie, and he says something, and then he asks Clint if he wants to, if he can do it again, because he thinks he can do it mm-hmm. better. And Clint said, oh, you want to waste everybody's time? <laughs> <laughs> which it's classic is yep. cool <laughs> that's cool to say yeah, like if you want to if you want to be really prepared for your one take you're entitled to do so but you you know you can't fuss around until you say like uh uh oaks to say oaks the right oaks. the right exactly the right way i have a i have a question for you guys do you think that like yeah. would there have been a better choice than matt damon like realistically like you do have to get like mm. an a-list actor like obviously ideally it's a south african person but like knowing how hollywood works that wouldn't really sure. happen so like would i'm sort of like he might have almost been the best choice even though i don't even think he even does that good of a job in the movie but could, i don't know do you guys have any alternatives i mean he i think affleck is taller <laughs> you know affleck, <laughs> affleck would be just <laughs> more well, of a i was kind of thinking of the Boston yeah. boys to like South African lad like pipeline, you know. Like I do yeah, say, sure. I think there's some similarity there. But Ben Affleck doesn't. I he would to me be one of the most the least convincing South Africans possible. <laughs> like, I just feel like yeah. David Ellis, if he dyes yeah. hair blonde, he kind of when they gave him a little bit of a looks nose. Because like yeah. Francois they Pinar did. has they like did. a pretty mm-hmm. significant nose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's also frustrating is you watch the documentary the the many documentaries about this and like all these guys are still alive this all happened in 1995 like they're all still alive they all look you know they look like older versions of the guys but they're not like ancient men and they all they can still reflect on this and the footage the the film does a i guess i wouldn't say great job because that implies that it's I don't know. The film it, it mimics a lot of this footage very carefully. It it error very very effectively. It uh, recreates some of this stuff, but to the point where you're like, well, why why wouldn't I just watch the footage from the time? You know, it's sure. pretty it's good quality. Enough. It's in color. Mm-hmm. Like, what are we what are we doing here? And this gets to my read on the film, and not that strong of a read, really, but from 
my research, it really seems like Morgan Freeman really wanted to do this and Clint Eastwood did him a solid. Like, it doesn't seem like Clint's heart is in this at all. It doesn't seem to be a Clint Eastwood movie in, uh, thematically. Like, it doesn't seem to have many of the interests that he typically does. I would say the film where the film is is the most interesting to me, and I wonder if you guys agree with this, is the, the all the stuff with the, the sort of uh, in the line of fire section, all the stuff with the security guys, and like sort of trying to navigate how what it, what it might be like to try to create a, a a a coalition government between people who previously had extraordinary racial animosity toward one another for good reason you know like that, yeah, I that's enjoyed, more interesting to me that initial stuff was interesting to me and i i will admit you know sort of impossible not to keep referencing this but lots of people who are talking about the possibility of a one state solution for palestine discuss what would be the potential difficulty of trying to create institutions and organizations that combine people of different religions, but also maybe more importantly, people whom were oppressed previously by the other people in the institution, yeah. but also you want to make enough space that it doesn't feel like you're, you know, the the Israeli claim is that uh, if there were a one state solution, they would just be immediately like pushed out or wiped out or oppressed uh, in return. Which So I agree is interesting. Well, I was just going to say, this is what I f- feel when I watch the film is like, I mean, should these should these people get the chance to behave themselves, the Afrikaners, I mean, like should they have they earned the right to be a part of a of a new South Africa? Do they need to just get the fuck out of there? Like and I guess I, I the note that I wrote was if you're asking like the guy who ran sewage to stay on, that seems like could be a cool move to say, you know what? It's it's just like a, a technical job that is well. We'd still at least want him to stick to around it. to to help the next get rid of the <laughs> the next. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, stick around to help the next guys, like to sort of get them up to speed on the yeah. systems that yeah, they've yeah, not yeah. been allowed to learn. Yeah. But if you were like working with De Klerk and liked his policies, I mean, I guess people, some people, De Klerk in which Nobel department? Peace Prize. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, which really part? good. Probably a lot of them. Uh, then I I would Which just question why keep this person around. And to get back to the earlier point, I did not like this bodyguard thing after a while because it seemed like totally tacked on way to create suspense in a film where they knew that the suspense was just like running dry. And this type of technique does not sit well with me. Yeah. Well, the the main like like the culmination of it was like the was airplane the scene where yeah. like fly yeah which I, I was just sort of like what like I'm like. Obviously, nothing's yeah, I, gonna. Ha- I was like, "Oh, they're just gonna be scared," and then it'll be like the thing you do during a game where a plane flies over. But like, that was right. like it. Like, well, that so was this, my feeling. These also, two, the, these two, that sequence, and another one, the the first one, the first time this happens, where we get a very menacing van, where it seems like somebody's gonna try to assassinate Mandela on his first day in office, and it turns out it's just a newspaper delivery guy. These both reminded me of the. The thing that our, our uh, on our Letters from Your Regime episode that, that Comrade Yui pointed out as one of the the, the strengths of that film uh, ascribed to Clint, which is in that movie, Clint does not do the sort of cheap, easy suspense thing. In, there's a scene where uh, someone is supposed to kill a dog and Clint mm-hmm. doesn't do the kind of gunshot and we don't know whether he shot the dog yeah. or not. Yep. And in this movie, he just goes ahead and does that twice with a kind of, ha ha, got ya, you were scared, and it turned out everything was fine. And in both cases, we know Nelson Mandela was not gunned down or crashed yes. in, uh, into with a plane. So like, fuck you. Like, what are you doing? Don't waste my time. So weird. And it's like they had to I like agree. film inside that plane. Like it's like they're like it's like that was a whole sequence. Yeah, like, huh? I did. I will. I will say I'm grateful to this scene for for bringing to my attention a wonderful new resource, which is the mm. Internet Movie Plane Database. Mm, <laughs> um, yeah, yep. which is a a resource of uh, it's a compendium of every airplane that's ever been in any movie, and it has also it lists the types of planes that are used in the sort of flyover of Mandela's inauguration and the plane with the uh, CGI Chester Williams face on the side of it. Yes, it was really great. By the way, the, the real Chester Williams did serve as rugby coach for the guys in the on the rugby team. But all this mm-hmm. is to say, like, the guy's still alive to be the rugby coach. Why are we doing this now? You know? Yeah. 
But I want to hold on. I want to address your your read of this film. I was you mentioned Comrade Yui, beautiful friend of the show, guest. Uh, it was such a treat to have them on. I was thinking about the two of you because, of course, you insisted on this episode in question that Clint is the goat. And I think it's a little bit of a cheat, a dodge to pick the films that are stinkers and just say, seems like this one doesn't really count as a Clint. I think we have to consider that, of course, there's, you know, you listen to any episode of Blank Check. We know that there are movies that directors don't put their their whole ass into and that's just the reality of Hollywood and how films get made but <laughs> this is you know this is like a, a Tom Stern and this is uh, it has the cheesy music that we've seen in some previous Clint's this is the worst example we're going to get to it in a sec I'm sure but well hold uh, on it, the music in this mm-hmm. is on a whole nother level of cheese yeah this, well, is, this movie this is, is a, straight cheese this is like the when the, speaking of Italy this is like the, the place where they make the pasta they mix it inside a giant carved out cheese wheel <laughs> correct i mean the when the overtones start singing the words oh, colorblind my i was God. my jaw was on the floor i couldn't believe overtone, what i was hearing hold on all right overtone corner so but wait 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 let me we, let me just finish let me just finish i i just okay. think that just because we're seeing what i believe are clint's worst instincts on display and maybe his his uh sometimes inclination to just let <laughs> other people lead a film I don't know if that counts as it not being a Clint film to me. I would have loved no, to no, see the, I, the best parts of a Clint film here. I agree with but that. Here's what, but here's what I here's what I'm gonna here's my pushback on that. I right. think, for example, other stinkers like Million Dollar Baby and recent stinkers like Million Dollar Baby mm-hmm. and Gran Torino have Clint th- thematic concerns in them, and I think they're just poorly explored or poorly executed whereas sure. i think this yeah. one feels like a favor to his friend morgan freeman this one feels like it has very little of clint eastwood's directorial fixations in it it just kind of feels like he thought it would be fun to go to south africa and he was the most famous director that morgan freeman had in his phone I mean, this film has a moment where he is regretting how he has maybe lost contact with his wife and daughter and children. And you're telling me these aren't yeah. things we've talked about on 20 other films? But it's Clint one films? scene. That's not what the movie is about at all. Like, it, it doesn't really come up again unless you're thinking that Clint Eastwood then relates to a man deciding to regard the entire population of a country as his family. <laughs> Which I don't well, know yeah. if he does. Is the issue is that the movie just isn't really about anything? Is that why we're kind of debating the Clint touch? Like the movie I, is very, very lightly about anything. Yeah. Yes, that's true. We, there's some some more stuff we gotta we the gotta get to. Well, you we can address the overtones if you like. That's you mentioned overtone. Have, must. Yeah. yeah, overtone yeah. corner. So, overtone yeah. corner. Overtone is a South African boy band acapella group that Clint and his wife, his then wife Dina Eastwood stumble upon while they're walking through South Africa, they're walking through Cape Town. Uh-huh. And Dina says, now this is, I think this whole thing is, honestly, if you want to talk about this as a Clint goat film, this is maybe Clint at his most generous because there's three three instances of generosity here. First, he makes this movie for Morgan Freeman. Second, mm-hmm. Dina Eastwood is like, I like this fucking boy band. Okay. They should be in the movie. And Clint says, sure. And three, this is the first film in which Scott Eastwood is credited as Scott Eastwood and not Scott Reeves. So this mm-hmm. is honestly maybe a sort of family man turn by Clint because Overtone is awful. These songs, one of them sounds so much Insanely like the fucking Moana bad. song. The, so how dare you even compare those two things? I'm not a Moana just the defender. Melody. I'm not a uh, <laughs> Lin-Manuel <laughs> head, I'm Moana. This is junk. I'm the girl <laughs> on the boat. I was waiting for Moana to come out. Glad we yeah, finally reached yep. it. Anyway, so Dina Eastwood even has a songwriting, like a lyrics credit on the song Invictus mm-hmm. 9000 Days. <laughs> Uh-huh. Along with one of the overtone guys. And then, of course, and we will cover this on our soon, our forthcoming Patreon. Sort of a soft announce. We haven't recorded any. Mm-hmm. But uh, That's true. Yep. we will be covering mm-hmm. the entirety of Eastwood and Company, her one season reality show right. mm-hmm. that covers Dina Eastwood as she manages the 
South African boy band Overtone <laughs> from Clint Eastwood's house in, in Pebble Beach or whatever, yes. and yeah. also features uh, a teenage Francesca Eastwood and her boyfriend Tyler something uh, as they burn a Birkin bag uh, for mm. art's sake and people get really Whoa. mad at them. What channel okay. was the show on? I think it was on E. I think it was e. on the Entertainment Channel. The Entertainment, yeah. right. yep. Mm-hmm. So we'll be covering that. Um, so look out for that. But yeah, I mean that it's just if the movie wasn't like corny as hell enough, there's yeah, there's as Ian, as you said, there's whatever, like eight white guys and one extremely light complected, less white guy singing. I'm colorblind. I will stand by my friends or whatever the fuck. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It sucks, dude. And like in in one of these documentaries, they're talking about how the South African the the Springbok team they had to get somebody to help them with the pronunciation of the new South African anthem, Nukosi Sikele e Africa, which mm-hmm. was a an illegal song to sing because yep. it was called a terrorist anthem that then becomes yep. one of the national anthems, and the. the, the that's just so much more interesting to have like these white guys have to learn basically a new language to sing a new national anthem. And instead of any of that, we get the most pentatonics ass <laughs> like uh, Asylum Studios Lion King rip off music. It's yeah, I mean, dude. I think you're right in saying that what we have here is a fascinating historical moment, a fascinating event within that larger historical moment. And basically everything about it is boiled down to the least interesting, like yeah. most West wing, uh, civility politics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. type of idea. We haven't talked about the housekeeper stuff. We haven't talked yeah. about the police with the little boy at the end. I mean, yeah. both of those, yeah, yeah. both of I those are, are yeah. Yeah. yeah, both of those I think are, are perfect, perfectly emblematic of the sort of victory in, in the symbolic, exclusively symbolic victory of this, this moment where like the white cops and the black kid, I honestly, I thought that Clint might be saving a goat move for the end and having at the, after this, this great, sort of symbolic victory the the white cop still chased the black kid off and like yeah, hit him shade, or something yeah get your pencil out and put one shade of gray on the whole movie would be yeah. wonderful this is what it's, i was just yes. begging for but and then we also have you know uh, uh damon brings an extra free ticket for the housekeeper so she gets to go to the game and then when they get back presumably she goes back to working as their housekeeper like there's no sort of structural change. Yes, exactly. The the reconciliation is only in terms of uh, white people kind of patting themselves on the back for having, you know, in the same way they do often with their, their differently ethnic housekeepers, right? To say like, look, right. we did a nice thing and that shows that racism yeah. is over and we're great. All right, Ian, yeah. I want to speak up for Ian's on the show. You were starting to say something. Yeah, no, I mean... I think with the yeah, with the absolutely zero shades of gray that we're talking about, it is just I don't know if like Clint just wanted to kind of make a straightforward like sports movie, like which mm. I guess are kind of inherently corny and sort of yeah. like uncomplicated. I like um, a sports movie. Don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah, I, like I, like I like Raging what? Bull. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like sports movies, one. but sports I don't like. Like I've mm-hmm. I enjoy even as a child I enjoyed the the now politically awful Gene Hackman Keanu Reeves film The Replacements. It's just about mm-hmm. a bunch of scabs. But yeah, like yeah. the the sort yeah, played of played on TBS a lot. Watching um, a movie, especially a movie about people overcoming, like people sort of transcending the limitations of their own bodies, oh, is yeah. yep. exciting. But mm-hmm. when you make it a symbol of a larger change that actually doesn't come, like it is. Look, it's impressive that these guys were able to uh, win a bunch of rugby games when everybody said this is a bad rugby team and they're only no, in the... But again, like the South African, they've won a bunch of like rugby World Cup stuff. Then, I'm like, yeah. were they really that bad? Like, was that kind, of, a, kind of overstated too? Great question. That, that When I found out that they were are considered like the current champions of rugby, yeah. it did take the bite out a little you know, bit. In, I my, will say that- in my Dublin hotel room, uh-huh. uh, or not the hotel room, I went to the, the hotel restaurant to have a uh, fish and chips delicious mm, shout out to that hotel the championship 
game of the Rugby World Cup was playing in the restaurant. Very strange, very, very eerie. And it was, I believe, New Zealand versus South Africa again. Yeah. And I was just, yeah. And well, as an aside, I want to shout out, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Like we've mispronounced so many things on this episode, but Nimrod Sijake uh, was a, okay. another person address, uh, arrested at the treason trial and he fled to Ireland. So good anti-colonial, anti-British partner to find refuge in. So great, shout out. wonderful. Well, and also, um, nice. and shout out to all of the Irish people who have rightly been making the connection between their own anti-colonial struggle and of course and Palestine struggle of yeah. people in Palestine. Any Irish person sort of yelling in a any kind of question time or like public comment thing that's filmed for television, basically always glad to see um, somebody mm-hmm. usually going to turn out well in a, an impassioned. Yes. Irish accent. Not to not to not to juice up this Red Bull Studios documentary <laughs> uh-huh. even more, but that also <laughs> includes the first black captain of the Springboks who became captain in 2019, which is just like a oh, little damn. added yeah. piece of, you know, things didn't change permanently. Uh, well, and it's an interesting piece of just story nuance. I found out that this was also the turning point for when South African rugby players were allowed to, I think maybe rugby players in the world cup in general were allowed to be paid as professionals because of what you're talking about. It, I guess it's connected to this idea of Corinthian spirit, which is yeah, like an Oxford rugby, sure. rugby gets professionalized in, in 1995. Yeah. yeah. So this idea that I mean, it came specifically from upper class people who didn't want working class people to be participating in sports. So obviously uh, amateur, yeah, class is only available to people who have enough free time to do this. And basically the reason that sports were, uh, I guess like decriminalized as a professional activity is because the Soviet sports teams were immediately so good because they were like semi-professional. They had all their needs met by Soviet society and, uh, the capitalist world said, this is uh, a nightmare for us. This is like a publicity nightmare. So we're going to let sports people be professionals now so i was reading about this and i thought wow right. there's just so many interesting elements to the story that are totally elided yeah. like basically everything here well and you know even now like one of the biggest and most egregious sites of extraction of wealth from young black people is in college sports right i mean there's yeah. this whole ongoing fight for college players who undeniably generate huge amounts of advertising 2021 supreme court decision Mm -hmm. so it's all you know all of the it's not like i don't want to sound like a couple of white leftist shitheads saying that race doesn't matter what i'm saying is that uh the the struggles of racially oppressed people are inextricably intertwined with the struggles of labor. It, it is the same struggle, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, you cannot cannot let it go for the sake of smoothing things over. Right. For sure. I mean, that's where, like, for me personally, as a... Uh, you mentioned at the top of the show that I'm a, a bit of a sporto, I believe, Jake. Mm-hmm. And for me, kind of like the way I've at least, I don't know, maybe mentally made it okay in my head at least with political beliefs is that i generally do only watch professional sports i mean at least with college they have been starting to get paid finally uh, a bit Mm -hmm. obviously that's not enough to make up for all the decades they weren't doing it but that like kind of when you watch these games like the labor is almost like it's so in front of your face basically like it's so like a part of it it's almost like one of the only meritocracies that we like have basically you know right there's that and then like the kind of the contracts that the players get the money that they make is like a big part of it and like it, it sort of puts those labor dispute issues like up front at least so i feel like it does if you are willing to engage with it like there is a lot of interesting things to think about in terms of like labor and you know it in relation to like an entertainment product and and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, I by the way, I, I found the name of the captain of the first black captain of the South African national team, Sia Kolisi. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Sia. He is uh, seems like a cool guy, and uh, incidentally, uh, quite handsome. Mm-hmm. And also, he talks in that documentary about meeting Mandela, and like they talked about how they growing up in different like their, their experience growing up in townships, and like you know, make a movie about this fucking guy. Yeah, I don't know. Yep. We are coming to the to Ian's heart out here, so um, I'm going to ask if either of you have any final thoughts. Oh, I have one. So we have there's a guy on the team named Yappy, mm-hmm. uh, and a couple of times they refer to 
Matt Damon's character as Cappy because he's the captain. My question uh-huh. is, uh, where the fuck is Chappy? <laughs> Even knowing that it was coming, it was a delight to hear. Apparently, uh, being oh, look, maybe like talk about held poem, captive whatever. is a weird oh, mascot fine. by Dean Edward. I actually, that's what my final thought is going to be about. That's my yeah. big brain reading. Please. All right. Well, I will say that I looked this poem up and was disappointed to discover that as we were talking about last week with Andrew T, uh, the idea that art, you know, is not based on the intention of the author necessarily. And we should look at all of the responses it generates, right? Just because it generates a single misinterpretation or bad response. I don't know that that disqualifies it, but also at a certain point, if there's a mass response in this way, then maybe we need to re-examine this piece or how successful it was in its goals. They're called tries. Uh, yes, you're right. They are called tries. The poem Invictus, if you read it, has been quoted in public to great attention by a number of people, including W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Nelson Mandela. It was quoted in the film Casablanca. And it was also quoted by Timothy McVeigh before his execution. Mm. Uh, and I, I just think that here we see an example of a piece of art, a poem that was tremendously helpful to some people and then has since been co-opted or interpreted differently by a bunch of weirdos and psychos. Obama quoted yeah. it when he was basically trying to link himself to Nelson Mandela in public on one of several occasions. He was a and big old Madiba sayer. But honestly, yeah, also yeah. to connect to connect the South African apartheid struggle with the struggle of Palestinians in Israel, Obama's one of the some of the big big knocks against Obama by the right when he was running were about his record as an anti-apartheid activist when he was at Occidental College, where he mm-hmm. also uh, and I recently saw this uh, image on Twitter and it made me made my stomach turn. We also like hung out with Edward Said. Wow. Okay. What there's like a picture of them at like a dinner table. Hmm. Interesting. So really make you mad. Anyway, we're all the captain of our soul, aren't we? Yeah. That's so my issue is that this piece of art is a piece of art about ostensibly about the end of apartheid and the transition of the government. And it is such a nothing film that you could basically be any type of person and come away feeling like you were patted on the back by this movie yeah and to me much. that's a f- failure of a piece of art about basically anything if if everybody can watch it and say like we we all are good and i'm good and you're good and that's so nice uh these, yeah. i mean we're talking about the people in question many of them are like the coach at the beginning you said quoted as saying this is the day the country goes to the dogs you know remember this, they this didn't day wanna... boys remember yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So let's just bring in something that makes people ask questions, think, feel something that's not yeah. just kind of like an empty warmth. This is this is what I would like to ask of this film. Yep. Beautifully put. Ian, final thoughts. Do you have anything you want to close out with? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I uh, totally agree with you in terms of just like kind of the empty nature of this film, how it ends. I mean, it, it is sort of interesting that this movie did get a little oscar attention it's sort of like the yeah. end of like clint's like aughts like kind of oscar run that started with mm-hmm. like mystic river to this and then like his next few films kind of didn't really go anywhere in that department at least but it was a pretty weak oscar year i kind of looked into it and like it was it truly kind of baffling at least some of the acting nominations but um yeah i don't know it's just kind of i was thinking got about juice that. you're right roger yeah. ebert yeah. i think liked it a lot well, yeah, this yeah. is embarrassing. I mean, yeah. Freeman Freeman was uh, got some buzz, I think, just because. I mean, when Mandela died, people were tweeting photographs of Morgan Freeman by mistake. Like it, yeah, they, they, he sort of that. successfully <laughs> intertwined his image with that of Nelson Mandela. Very strange. Yeah, I think it's just like it speaks to how like he's just been he's just an uncomplicated again in, in the mass media way. He's an uncomplicated yeah. figure. And then like this movie just doesn't even try to mess with that whatsoever. Why not complicate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it seems like Clint would be down to complicate. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it, like I, I think about this movie in relation to like Richard Jewell a bit. I know that's a future episode for you guys. So I don't want to stick to it too much, but it's also no, like. No, we're not covering that one. <laughs> yeah. It's not, that's not going to come up. No. We're not using really our thinking, skip no. on not, that one. Yeah. Not feeling it. Yeah. Our one skip. <laughs>
<laughs> but like that one, you know, it's also kind of said, you know, more in the background, I guess, of like a, of a national sporting event yep. also in the mid 90s. But I mean, I feel like that movie is just so much more effective at, I guess, I don't know, maybe Olivia Wilde's character isn't the most uh, not a lot of gray there. But beyond that, it's like, you know, it's yeah, how like the cops are like trying to fuck him over and. And yeah. just like how this country, you know, I just feel like there's a lot more of that going on there. And they're just, I, there's none of that here. And it's Clint just. Clint is at his best when he's talking about regular people. Yeah. And this one, he gets into legendary types. Do you, like, are any of his movies that are like on the corner end? Like, do you guys like any of them? Like, do you think any of them are like effective cornball entertainment? Yeah. I mean, I think Unforgiven is not corny, but it gets into kind of, it's very sparse and direct. And it is direct. Yeah, I, I think it's it yeah. confronts the issues that it's talking about pretty head on. Right. So it's a little straightforward in that sense. Yeah, I think also like absolute power could be corny and isn't and is. I mean, hockey tonk man borders on on better for corn. It. I like. Yeah, like the film. flags of our fathers, Ian. I think you would accuse of corn, and I think is very yep. effective because it's sort of about corn. But mm -hmm. you know, uh, can we do our segment? Sure. All right, do it. Okay, so this is the Ian Victus World Cup. In order to determine <laughs> okay. once or for wow, all, love it. the world champion Ian of 2023, the mm -hmm. two of you will compete to answer a series of trivia questions pertaining to famous Jakes. You will <laughs> no, each be given the I chance to answer for this. first, mm -hmm. because uh, Ian, Ian, uh, your your Oaxacan Wi-Fi uh, does not give you great answering speed, so you're, we're going to switch mm -hmm. off. But great. if you get love it wrong. It. The other Ian will get a chance to steal. The outcome of this competition will determine the new co-host of podcast. I love it. Love this. This is, huge. this is my chance to. And also, there's a cake on the line. There's a piece of cake from the grocery oh, store. Wow, yeah. is that true? So you would mail this piece of cake? I'll to explain what happens Oaxaca to the cake. If that, I'll explain what happens to the cake. That I, Ian's, like, are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, let's do it. Okay. Great. I'm ready. The first, uh, so this first one is going to be Ian Green, because I alphabetically. This first Jake is like me in many ways. Partly Ashkenazi Jewish, partly not. Generally seen to wear facial hair. Has a sister. Questions have been raised as to whether we're actually Persian. And as children, we both set off model rockets. He is unlike me in that his mother's first husband was historian Eric Foner, and in that he is famously very handsome. Who is this Jake? <laughs> Uh, is it Jake Gyllenhaal? That is correct. One point for Ian Green. Okay, cool. I was what nervous is his there relationship for a bit, to Eric Foner? His mother was married to Eric down? Foner before she was married to Stephen Gyllenhaal, his father. I think you might have even mentioned this on the I know podcast. That I, have. I'm being I know that again. I have. Jake Gyllenhaal has never been in a Clint, right? Can't no, think of any. Good, though. Yeah. Okay, Ian Ryan. This Jake is a true family man. He stepped up All right. when his twin brother Tom was killed. He worked hard to be accepted by the family of the woman he loved, despite strong cultural differences. Later, he raised children of his own and even took in an orphan with the voice of a woman in her 70s and another orphan with an interesting hairstyle. Who is this, Jake? Wow, I do not know. This seems harder know. than the one you gave me. You should know this. Do you want to, you got to give it a, a guess. Well, I will tell you that I'm constantly listening to podcast quizzes, and they're so easy at home. But I got to just reiterate that in live, the pressure is immense, just yeah. overwhelming. Immense. All right, I'm happy to let if if <laughs> Ian Green wants to go for a steal, I think he should be allowed to hear the clues one more time. Do you not want to guess? Uh, I'm gonna say, what? Well, yeah, written. I don't. I don't know. This is some type of animated figure. I, I and it's not the only Jake that I'm aware of. Is well, actually, I'm not going to say other Jakes that I'm aware of out of uh, interest in the rest of the game. But say say an animated Jake figure that you can think of. Okay, Jake the dog. Jake the dog of Adventure Time fame. That's incorrect. Okay. Yeah. Ian yep. Green for this deal. Can you repeat the clue? This Jake is a true family man. He stepped up, metaphorically speaking, when his twin brother Tom was killed. He worked hard to be accepted by the family of the woman he loved, despite strong cultural differences. Later, he raised children of his own and even took in an orphan with the voice of a woman in her 70s and another orphan with a hairstyle that raises some questions. Who is this, Jake? 
dude. I, <laughs> it's a real, this is a riddle, man. This is good. Yeah. Damn. All the people screaming at home. Yeah. I, uh, All right. I know. It's so painful to know about. It's so painful to know about. What are you giving up to? Yeah, I yeah. honestly could not even have you guys. Yeah. It's Jake Sully. It's, of course, Jake Sully from oh, the Turuk Makto himself. Oh. No one remembers that movie. No one remembers uh-huh. it. Come yeah, on. fuck off. <laughs> no. no one remembers it. I wouldn't it. go that far, but I guess I did just okay. forget that his Fair name enough. was Jake for, Fair this, enough. for okay. this critical second. Um, Ian Green, you're I feel next. like the, the twin brother, mm-hmm. like, I, like, cause that's real. Yeah. That's like the first 20 seconds of Avatar, and you completely forget I, about I'll, it. I. I'm way with you. I'm way with you. You know, Jake Gyllenhaal was in the running for the. Yeah. Is that true? Um, yeah. Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal. All right. Uh, Chris Evans, Channing Tatum, a lot of guys. Matt Damon, of course, famously turned it down, and he also turned down ten percent of the gross. Wow. Fortune favors the bull. All right, millions. number three. I have not seen the program this Jake is famous for because I'm an adult man, but I understand it's supposed to be pretty good, especially when you've been smoking that funny stuff. Uh, He sounds a lot like a famous robot. See, now, this is why I didn't want to reveal my goddamn answer from before. I'm going to kill you. I'm running out of facts about this Jake because, again, I'm an adult. Who is he? Ian Green. Okay, Mm -hmm. so... You might be helped out by (laughs) the fact that he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. (laughs) <laughs> this could be a huge saving grace for me. And you got to guess quickly because we have a lot more Jake. Yeah, one minute has a hard out um, in one minute. Correct. Yeah, let's yeah. do a speed round. Let's do. Let's turn this into speed rounds. Okay. Yeah. You're wrong. Okay. Oh, okay. Next, it was Jake the dog. All right, yeah, it's Jake the dog. One. Jake the dog from Adventure Time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Number next, J- this Jake's got one of the top controversy sections in the Wikipedia game, including subsections content controversies, scam allegations, party complaints, public nuisance lawsuits, and COVID-19, attending a riot at an Arizona mall and FBI raid, sexual assault allegations, investigation in Puerto Rico, SEC fine for undisclosed cryptocurrency sponsorship. Hell, I'd pay this guy to punch him in the face. Who is this Jake? Of course, uh, I believe I'm going to get his last name wrong. It's uh, famous member of the comedy troupe Jake Johnson is the one from New Girl. So is it Jake? What the fuck is his last name? Uh, What's his brother's last name? J- what? <laughs> uh, Out of time. Jake oh Ian Green. No, 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 I don't, no, I, Ian Green. Do you no, have? I'm do you have this? It's Jake Paul. Oh God. Oh, I don't think about that oh, at all. Okay, all right. Uh, Jake, I don't think about them at Paul. Yeah. N- next, this Jake may not be. This uh-huh. is for Ian Green. This Jake may not be as famous as his, yep. quite as famous as his father, but he seems a lot easier to work with. An accomplished neon green electric violin player, despite a knife wound to his hand. Just don't let him get near your enormous interdimensional travel machine based on plans you received from outer space. Who is this Jake? Um. <laughs> Uh, is it Jake Kasdan? I don't know. Ian, do you have a steal? That unfortunately was also going to be my guess. What is? Yeah, I don't know who this is. This is Jake Busey. So far, Ian Green has one point, oh. and he is leading. Okay. Okay. I have a point from Jake the dog. I got a steal. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, that counts. My my one man. There's been only two points one in one. the whole okay. game. Please. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Uh, number four, this or whatever. This Jake is a lot like me in that he's a fucking loser. <laughs> Unlike me, it has made him very successful. Okay. He hosted the most program, most viewed program in the history of his network, has a TV show with his name on it, and also famously called the first 2020 presidential debate a, quote, hot mess inside a dumpster fire inside a train wreck for which he was awarded a special Pulitzer Prize for being an unimaginative Reddit ass <laughs> dork boy. Who is this Jake? Is this Jake Tapper? You are correct. Ian Ryan takes the lead with mm. one point. Hell yeah. Hell okay. Yeah. Last one. Now, uh, this Jake may have no father at all, but he certainly grows up to be one. An avid tinkerer and a youth motorsports enthusiast. Although he lacks charisma, he nonetheless charms an elected official and is thus in the running for Riz King, perhaps even Riz Lord. <laughs> 
genuinely, though, he's had a pretty hard time since his childhood prominence and has been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. We wish him well here on the podcast for me. Ian Green, who is this Jake? Okay, so he might not have a father. This is Jake? Mm-hmm. I mean, okay. it, in in some ways, these uh, these clues have been blurring fiction and reality, to be clear. Mm-hmm. 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 I got nothing. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, let's hear that sound. Yeah, there we Ian go. Ryan, do you have a guess? I'm gonna get you're gonna hit us with the famous steel pass. A pass for steel. Don't know who this is. Okay. It was Jake Lloyd who played uh okay. Anakin uh-huh. Skywalker. And with that Ian Ryan, you have won Invictus. And that as a prodigious show. As I said, <laughs> The outcome of this competition will determine the new co-host of podcast for me. And Ian Ryan, since you won, your dreams coming true. Pick, and your new, the new co-host free. of podcast for me is Ian Green. In that, it's going to be the two of you. Wow. I'm leaving the, the show. Oh wow! wow. And, uh, I could see how I was tricked. I got to see what I want to show you. What spa. happens with the the okay. cake? Hold on! Right. Hold on! You have exactly one minute. Uh, I'm on Ian Green's mic. You can hear me? Yep. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear? Can he, you can I hear? can see you. Yep. Okay, I'm opening the cake. Uh-huh. I'm opening the trash can. Can you mic, th- can you mic this? You the- <laughs> Don't put the cake in the trash. This is my nightmare. The oh, my God. So nobody can have it. Okay, I'm going back. <laughs> I'm gonna fish that out later. Probably take a bite. Um, hey, thank you. This this is the pride of the Ians. Do not waste. Food. I didn't have my headphones on. Was that funny? Had to grow the... Yeah, it was funny. But now I'm I'm telling Ian that I back his plan to eat it out of the trash. Somebody had to grow the wheat to make that cake, and there it is in the trashed can. What my do you think Lord. about like the people who have to make, for example, the uh, they grow the wheat for the. Um, for the gun that was used to kill. <laughs> what are you yeah, no, about? I was gonna say, what about the people who, uh, whatever, build, make the squibs that are used in some of our favorite films that are ruined, yeah. in order to be enjoyed. Think uh-huh. about all the the lives will be sure. touched by that great bit that I just did. You know, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See it's that's I'm worth saying. eating a million slices of cake. All right, I have to thank Ian Green for coming yeah, on the show. Ian's got to go. You're a brave man, and it was a treat to have you. And uh, thank you so the much next for you movie as well, we're watching Ian. is Hereafter, starring yeah. uh, Francois. All right, yeah, starring Max Bye. Demon again. Thanks for being on the show, Ian. Uh, other yep. Ian, stick around. Later, I have to Ian. ask you what you want to plug. Bye, by Ian Ryan. Yeah, for sure. Have a good so, one. Ian Green, thank you for joining us today on the podcast. You for me, you did a great thank job. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now? And where else folks can find more of that Ian Green magic? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, no, I'm a part of a uh, kind of recent startup called Lalo. The URL is lalo.io. It's is it a named curate- after Lalo Schifrin, who scored the D- Dirty Harry films? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, good good catch. Is um, it really? Uh, no, probably not. I, I, I didn't come <laughs> up with the name, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll run it by them, though. But um, yeah, no, it's me and, and two of my friends out here. Uh, they they started. I've kind of recently joined, but it's a um yeah it's a curated like LA events page. It's basically in the world of like film and music and like you know local like markets and just and art openings and things like that. And we kind of go through everything, pick out like the stuff that we would want to go to, and just kind of try and streamline it. And it's just it's a very pretty looking website. You can also submit your own events, you know. So we're trying to also help highlight cool local events that you know maybe don't want to just like throw their thing on eventbrite and then it just goes into that whole thing so we're basically just trying to cut through all the noise cool. um yeah just look at it uh put your email in get, there's a nice newsletter that comes how out you, every how week you get to it for the folks listening at home yeah it's l a l l o dot i o so lalo dot i o that's the uh, URL. And we're on Sweet. Instagram too, of course. Um, but yeah, check it out. Just it's put a your cool email website. I've, I've used yeah. it. I've looked at it. It's uh, lovely. Uh, very nice looking. I can confirm that Jake did sign up. I saw his email on our sign up thing. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate it.
Yeah. Sorry about my email. Sorry about the different uh, offensive words in my email address. Sorry yeah, it's an Im- it's impressive amount, honestly. Like I didn't yeah. even think email addresses could be that long. It can be pretty but... long now. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, of blockchain and stuff. Anyway, mm. uh, that's uh, that's great. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> um, remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review. Helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show. Tell a friend, tell your dad, write it underneath uh, an airplane that you fly dangerously low over a rugby stadium. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Clint Eastwood podcast, you can email us at podcastyforme at gmail.com. All this is at podcastyforme.com, uh, conveniently located for you there. You can also go to shootingyourselfinthehead.com. That'll just uh, quickly redirect you over to our website. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. As Ian Prime mentioned, uh, next week we're talking Hereafter, so join us for that one. And uh, on behalf of all Ians around the world, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.